Today is January 3rd, 2024. As the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine against Russia continues to unravel, uh, we just saw another massive Russian missile barrage conducted along with inter intermittent large-scale drone attacks. There are further developments in the U.S. proxy war in the Middle East, and I'm referring to Israel's military campaign against the Gaza Strip, the Palestinian people, and the way this conflict is being used to escalate across the entire region. Israel, while focusing mainly on the Gaza Strip, continues carrying out military operations in the West Bank. They're also striking targets in southern Lebanon, targeting Hezbollah there. They're also carrying out military strikes across Syria. The United States is carrying out strikes all across the region, in Syria, in Iraq. Uh, they're conducting warfare off the coast of Yemen. And now we're hearing talk across the Western media from, from very familiar sources within the U.S. Uh, ruling interests, talking about how Iran is the ultimate target here, which is something that I have maintained was the entire purpose of this conflict from the very beginning. Hamas was used to trigger a conflict that the U.S. ultimately wanted to escalate toward war with Iran. Let's focus on what is going on in Gaza first. Let's look at live UAMap.com. They have a Israel-Palestine map, and if you zoom into the Gaza Strip, you can see how much more uh, how much more extensive this incursion into Gaza is compared to others uh, in recent years. 2008, 2009, Operation Cast Lead, and 2014, Operation Protective Edge. This is much longer in in scale and in duration than both of those operations. You can see how Gaza City has been completely encircled. Uh, Israeli forces are closing in on the last remaining pockets. Heavy fighting is taking place in these neighborhoods. This this is the same area that extensive fighting took place in 2014 as well. But the, the difference is this incursion is slowly creeping across the entire strip. It is not focused on just the north or the south or just a little bit of both. It is a much more extensive incursion into the entire into the entirety of the Gaza Strip. Now in the south we see Khan Yunus, a very similar campaign to encircle and then tighten uh, a perimeter around this densely populated. You can just see how how dense the urban build is in this area. Uh, and uh, as I pointed out, they had Israeli forces had cut the strip in half here, uh, and this was to prevent fighters and material from moving back and forth. And people will say, Brian, there's all kinds of tunnels. Israeli forces are finding these tunnels. They're destroying them. Of course, there's plenty of tunnels that have not been found, have not been destroyed. But the, the vector sum of this fighting favors Israel. The worst case scenario for Israel is that the fighting will at some point become unsustainable and they may have to withdraw from from the Gaza Strip, as they have in previous incursions. Their military will remain a formidable fighting force in the region. The government will remain in power. Worst case scenario is that there is some sort of shakeup in leadership. The Netanyahu administration is replaced by someone else. And Israel continues as a uh, obedient and useful proxy of US power in the Middle East. Uh, the existence of Israel is not at stake here. Israeli military power is not even really at stake here. There are no uh, nations or even militant groups in the region interested in invading and dividing and destroying Israel. Uh, the, the largest and most formidable fighting force anywhere near Israel is Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. They have made it very clear that their objective is to defend 
Lebanon. That is what they're doing. Despite constant attacks by Israel, uh, there is an exchange of fire, but they are not going to conduct any sort of incursion into Israeli territory. That is just not going to happen. So the worst case scenario for Israel is that they have to withdraw from this incursion like they have, they've had to in 2014 and 2008, 2009. Uh, the best case scenario is that they're able to establish some sort of permanent military occupation of all of Gaza and incrementally push the Palestinian people out of Gaza permanently. That is, the, in, in, many, in many minds, uh, in, in the ruling administration and those who support it, that is the ideal outcome of all of this. Now, let's, let's take a look at some other aspects of the fighting. These are somewhat older articles, 21st December. IDF says it's fighting in new areas as it nears end of ground offensive in North Gaza. But, but does that mean that they're going to end the fighting in northern Gaza and leave? No, I, that's not what it means. The article says IDF spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said on December 20th, 2023, that the military had begun to battle terror operatives in Gaza City neighborhoods of Daraj and uh, Tufa, where one of the last Hamas uh, one of Hamas's northern Gaza battalions remains, indicating the military appears to be nearing the end of its ground offensive in the northern part of the Strip. I I'll get into Israel's future plans for Gaza here in just a moment. The IDF has said it has operational control over Beit Hanun, Jabalia, and several other areas in northern Gaza as it works to dismantle Hamas's battalions. The IDF has also indicated that it will take only several more days to complete operations in Shedjaiya, where some of the fiercest fighting took place. And that was the, the same neighborhood where extremely fierce fighting took place in 2014, Operation Protective Edge. There's also heavy fighting, as I showed you on the map, in uh, su the southern area of the Gaza Strip, Khan Yunus. The article says in Khan Yunus, the IDF said troops of the 7th Armored Brigade identified a group of Hamas operatives inside a building and called in an airstrike. A rocket launcher in the area was also hit as it prepared to fire projectiles at Israel, the army said. And then, of course, uh, around New Year's Eve, New Year's, Hamas or other militant groups were launching rockets into Israel. These rockets cause very little damage even when they do hit. Uh, many of them are intercepted and people say, see, Israel's military operation into Gaza is achieving nothing. They're still launching rockets. What people fail to understand is that from the Netanyahu administration's perspective and from the perspective of extremist elements in Israeli uh, society who support the Netanyahu administration, these rockets are a pretext to continue brutalizing the Palestinian people, to continue the military operation. This is not going to convince them. Otherwise, it is going to harden their position and their desire to continue military operations. The idea that Israel's genuine objective here is to eliminate Hamas, I believe that that idea is extremely flawed. This current administration, the Netanyahu administration, maneuvered Hamas into power specifically to create a perpetual pretext to wage war against the Palestinian people. They do not want Hamas gone because Hamas gone means someone possibly more reasonable, more measured, more pragmatic might take their place and Israel will be forced to sit down and negotiate. They do not want to do that. They want to continue fighting a war that they clearly have the advantage in. They have nonetheless killed Hamas fighters. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, the death toll for Israeli forces continues to mount. Uh, I believe they're somewhere around 150, maybe, maybe a little more, a little less than that. More importantly, we know that thousands and thousands of Palestinian civilians are dying and many more are being injured and many many more are being displaced and we have to remember that that was the plan all along and i continuously go back to this old guardian article from october 10 we're focusing on maximum damage ground offensive into gaza seems imminent so this was right before they launched the ground 
off uh, offensive and they openly the israeli military openly said that the priority was to create maximum damage not focus on that accuracy which is an admission to indiscriminately waging war against what is mostly a civilian population now what about plans for the Gaza Strip after this military operation concludes, whenever it concludes. We have articles like this, far-right minister calls for Israel to fully occupy Gaza, reestablish settlement. So that, that is the, the worst case scenario for the Palestinian people living in the Gaza Strip. Uh, this is, is the Israeli heritage minister. Uh, the article says Israel should fully occupy the Gaza Strip following the war, claiming the Palestinians are incapable of controlling the territory without turning it into a terror hotbed. Anyone who is today selling the idea that the Palestinians can go back to running things doesn't remember what happened on October 7th, this minister told Khan Public Radio. The article also says... While the United States has called repeatedly for Israel to return to the negotiation table, this is just for public consumption. They, they are encouraging Israel to continue, intensify these military operations for as long as possible. That is what's going on in reality. But uh, yes, they are publicly, repeatedly calling for Israel to return to the negotiation table and begin working toward a two-state solution with the Palestinians once the war is over. Israeli officials have pushed back against the idea. Earlier this month, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that Israel would retain an open-ended security presence in Gaza and ruled out any possibility for the Palestinian Authority to return to the Gaza Strip as its governing body. So no more Hamas and no more Palestinian Authority, which means a de facto Israeli military occupation and administration of the Gaza Strip. Despite his assistance that Israel needs to maintain control over Gaza security, Netanyahu has also stressed that Israel does not wish to displace Palestinians and has no plan to conquer, occupy, or govern the Gaza Strip. Again, no, nobody believes that, not even uh, Benjamin Netanyahu when he says things like this. Now, as I've said, Israeli losses are admittedly mounting. We have seen even from the Times of Israel them um, uh, admitting day to day uh, losses of Israeli soldiers in the fighting. We also see from Hamas and other militant groups in Gaza videos of them attacking Israeli troop concentrations, uh, Israeli patrols, and also Israeli armored vehicles. The problem with this is that the footage is very inconclusive. There is no way to tell just how much damage is being done to Israeli equipment, especially its, its armor. We see RPGs, mines, uh, improvised explosives placed on or near these vehicles. We see explosions. Sometimes it's difficult to see if the, the explosion actually uh, hits the vehicle or is is coming from a strike on the vehicle or maybe near the vehicle We often don't even see that much. We see a blast and then the video cuts and I understand that the fighters don't want to stick around uh, For the Israeli forces to return fire, but this makes it very difficult to determine What is what is actually happening with Israeli armor? Is it being? uh uh, damage severely? Is it taking minor damage? Is it able to continue operations? Is it able to be repaired quickly? Are they being burned and totally lost? And at, and at what rate? And if we don't know that, we don't actually know how sustainable Israeli military operations are. We, we see them persisting much longer than a lot of people suspected. I had said at the very beginning, if they pace themselves, they will be able to achieve their objective, which is to erase Gaza, essentially. Not to defeat Hamas. Again, Hamas is a global network. You cannot, you cannot conduct a military operation in Gaza and eliminate Hamas. And Israel, Israel does not want to eliminate Hamas. They want Hamas to exist at least somewhere so that they can be brought in and used as a catalyst for continued conflict. They do not want a two-state solution with the Palestinian People. This current administration at least does not want that. In a certain sense, the ball is kept in play. Israel continues this military operation, and along the periphery of this main operation in Gaza, we see Israel conducting strikes in southern Lebanon. We see them conducting strikes in Syria. There was another strike uh, very recently. And we also see the United States 
conducting strikes in Syria on uh, militant groups in Iraq, and now they're increasingly involved off the coast of Yemen. And we see articles like this. From the Telegraph, the West may now have no option but to attack Iran. Tehran will only accept it as miscalculated if it faces significant costs uh, for its recent acts of aggression. And uh, John Bolton was most recently U.S. National Security Advisor for the Trump administration. Uh, the Duran, Alex Christoforo, and Alexander McCurris did an excellent and, and very short video on just this. And they, they laid out the, the fact that this entire conflict, this was always going to lead up to a, some sort of confrontation with Iran. It was always being used as a pretext for an eventual conflict with Iran. And here is John Bolton and many others across the Western media trying to push everything in this direction. And so what does this article say by John Bolton? It says, Houthi attacks on commercial shipping and U.S. Navy vessels in the Red Sea threaten the global economy, endangering the vital Suez Canal trade route. As if 14 such attacks in the past month and against Israel directly were not enough, Iran has now joined the fray. The Pentagon said on December 23rd that an Iranian-launched drone struck an Israeli-affiliated merchant ship in the Indian Ocean. And what Bolton is trying to do, just like uh, the rest of the the ruling circles of interest in the U.S. and and in Europe, there he's trying to link Hamas to Iran, and he's trying to link every everyone doing anything in the Middle East to Iran to create a pretext for war with Iran itself. And we remember uh, after October seventh last year, this was a, an immediate link made. Oh, Iran was backing Hamas. And then when pressed for evidence of that, the U.S. government admitted that there is no evidence. Most likely, Iran had no idea this attack was coming and they had nothing to do with it. And yet they will continue inferring this to create a justification for war, because that is what the U.S. has consistently done throughout its history. It manufactures a pretext for war to carry out military aggression against one of its adversaries in, in what is otherwise an unprovoked war of aggression. Then Bolton lays out what his solution is, and this is toward the end of the article. Uh, Only if Israel, America, Britain, and others show they possess the resolve and capability to impose significant costs on Iran as punishment for its aggression will they persuade the Ayatollahs that uh, proceeding further will bring them intolerable pain. Very likely, only direct military force applied against critical targets inside Iran will impose such costs, proving to Tehran it has miscalculated not only about Israel, but on President Biden and the West more generally. That is why the evidence of a direct Iranian attack on a commercial ship in the Indian Ocean is potentially so important. Uh, it has been clear for years that overthrowing the mullahs, replacing them with some other form of government that enjoys the support of Iran's citizenry, is central to decreasing insecurity throughout the Middle East, not the United States, which is invading and illegally occupying multiple nations in the region, uh, Iran. Iran has, is, is the, the center of the problem. That's what we're supposed to believe. Arab funding of terrorist actions against Israel is hard to find today, especially as full open diplomatic relations with Jerusalem continue to expand. If Iran's line of credit to the likes of Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis and other barbarians disappears, uh, their ability to survive except in remote Afghan encampments will palpably decrease. Now, this is interesting because what he's saying here is partially true. Uh, the Arab world is increasingly pivoting away from the United States, and as they do, they abandon all of these proxies that they had been arming and funding on behalf of the U.S. Groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda were used by the U.S. as a tool in the region, and they laundered money, weapons, and other forms of support through their Arab allies. As these Arab allies begin pivoting away from the U.S. toward multipolarism, their desire to continue supporting these armed groups, which are causing as much problems for themselves as they are for their supposed adversaries, nations like Syria and Iran, uh, their, their support for these groups are diminishing and these groups themselves are becoming more isolated and, and incapable of 
posing the threat that they had at one point in the region. It also means that groups like Hamas, which have also been used as a tool uh, by the U.S. and by Israel to advance their own uh, geopolitical objectives, groups like this will have a choice whether to cease to exist or to pivot toward a more pragmatic and genuine form of resistance, more along the lines of what Hezbollah is doing. And so people like John Bolton see a window of opportunity closing. They see the region is irreversibly changing. And if they don't do something now, it will change and there'll be nothing they can do to reverse it. That, that is what they understand. They see the window of opportunity closing. They had one last chance to use extremist elements within Hamas uh, who, who are very predictable in, in how they think and how they act, just like the rest of the Muslim Brotherhood. They saw this last opportunity to use them to provoke a conflict they think they may be able to expand into eventually war with Iran. And uh, this is what Bolton concludes by saying, that is the outcome Washington and London should seek. Instead of pushing Israel for more pauses, truces, ceasefires, or the like, allow Jerusalem to achieve its legitimate objective of eliminating Hamas as a military and political force. Israel created, created and maneuvered them into power. Don't forget that even according to Israeli media. Uh, that is one sure way to convince the Ayatollahs their gambit has failed and their own end may be near. So he's manufacturing a pretext for war with Iran that he has always wanted long before October 7th. And this is just his latest attempt to sell that war he has always desired uh, by, by citing October 7th, despite there being no evidence at all linking Hamas and Iran. And this is exactly what the U.S. has used Israel to do for decades. They've used Israel as a, as a pretext for a U.S. military presence in the region. They've used Israel as a provocateur to stir up nations in the region, uh, to create windows of opportunity for the U.S. to carry out military aggression. They've done this repeatedly. They have attempted to do this to Syria more recently. And this has always been part of the formula to try to drag, provoke Iran and drag Iran into a, a war with Israel and then eventually the U.S. And even as the U.S. pretends, the U.S. pretends to implore Israel to return to the negotiation table, we see articles come out like this. This is from Time Magazine. Biden administration bypasses Congress again on emergency weapon sales to Israel. So they're saying Israel uh, you should decrease the intensity of your military operations, return to the negotiation table, but here's some more uh, bombs and artillery shells and other equipment that you need to actually intensify your military operation. So again, plausible deniability. We publicly, outwardly, we want peace and stability, but our actions are committed to uh, expanding instability and provoking further war. And this is what I have pointed out in previous updates, that this is purely an exercise in maintaining plausible deniability. This has always been the plan uh, for years and years. U.S. policy papers have talked about specifically how the U.S. can provoke a war with Iran while actually trying to appear to pursue peace. I've talked about this many times. I've cited this paper many times. Uh, 2009, Brookings Institution, paper, Which Path to Persia Options for a New American Strategy Toward Iran. And I want to go over a part that I have read many times, but I want to go over another part that I have not really focused on in the past. First, I want to read the part about how the U.S. understands Iran does not want war with the U.S., but how the U.S. can try to provoke Iran into a war anyway. And, and while doing so, convince the world that the U.S. wanted peace the whole time, and it was Iran that brought it upon themselves. So this is what the paper says, and uh, the link will be in the video description. You can read it for yourself if you don't believe me. It would be far more preferable if the United States could cite an Iranian pro provocation as justification for airstrikes before launching them. Clearly, the more outrageous, the more deadly, and the more unprovoked the Iranian action, the better off the United States would be, of course. It would be very difficult for the United States to goad Iran into such a provocation without the rest of the world recognizing this game, which would then undermine it. So they admit that Iran is not going to attack the U.S. unprovoked, is not interested in war with the U.S. The U.S. needs to see a uh, find some way to provoke Iran clandestinely to carry out some sort of retaliation that they can pro 
pre present to the world as uh, unprovoked aggression from Iran. And then it continues. It says, one method that would have some possibility of success would be to ratchet up covert regime change operations in the hope that Tehran would retaliate overtly or even semi-overtly, which could then be portrayed as an unprovoked act, act of Iranian aggression. So they admit that the primary U.S. policy toward Iran is lying about the threat Iran poses to the U.S. and uh, using that as a pretext for unprovoked war of aggression against Iran. That, that is what they are spelling out in black and white here. It also says, in a similar vein, any military operation against Iran would likely be very unpopular around the world and require the proper international context, both to ensure the logistical support the operation would require and to minimize the blowback from it. The best way to minimize international opprobrium and maximize support, however grudgingly or covert, is to strike only when there is widespread conviction that the Iranians were given but then rejected a superb offer, one so good that only a regime determined to acquire nuclear weapons and acquire them for the wrong reasons would turn it down. Under those circumstances, the United States or Israel could portray its operations as taken in sorrow, not anger, and at least some in the international community would conclude that the Iranians brought it on themselves, that is in quotation marks, by refusing a very good deal. So they admit that they would be lying to the international community. They deliberately provoked a war with Iran, but they will spin it uh, to blame Iran for the war and make it out as if the US and Israel had no choice when they were the ones who provoked the war in the first place. That is, that is US foreign policy uh, signed and dated and uh, on the internet for everyone to see. These, these think tanks, which produce U.S. foreign and domestic policy. Uh, these think tanks are funded by corporations. These policy papers are taken by lawyers, turned into bills, which are then given to lobbyists to bring to Washington to get signed and rubber stamped. That is how U.S. foreign and domestic policy is actually developed. And this is what they were writing in 2009. And this is uh, something that they have been pursuing ever since. So this deal that they were talking about is the, the Iran nuclear deal, which followed shortly after this paper was published. Uh, it was signed under the Obama administration. They had no intention, the US had no intention of ever honoring it under the Trump administration. Trump unilaterally withdrew from it, uh, accused Iran of violating it. And now we see the Biden administration, which vowed to return to the Iran nuclear deal, uh, never going back to it. That Again, that was just to, to maintain the illusion that there is no continuity of agenda, that each presidential administration has agency. Now, the, these foreign policy objectives are pursued regardless of who is in the White House, regardless of who is in Congress. Uh, it went from the Obama administration to the Trump administration to the Biden administration. The, the agenda continued moving forward regardless. And it continues to do so to this day. Now, that was the plan in 2009. And if you read through this entire paper, you will see entire chapters dedicated to using Israel as a proxy to attack Iran, to precipitate a war that the US could then wade into afterwards. And you can see that everything that the US has done from 2000 onward has been taken straight from this paper, almost verbatim. The problem is that things have changed. Things have changed since this paper was written in 2009. There are huge limitations that now face the US in what it can and cannot do diplomatically, economically, and militarily. We can see the use of sanctions has diminished in returns for the, for the US. We see militarily the US proxy war in Ukraine against Russia exposing the limitations of Western military industrial production. And we see the growing futility of US attempts to contain China in Asia Pacific. But it, that, that reality that has emerged since 2009 has not stopped Washington, Wall Street, Brussels, and London from attempting to pursue these objectives, advance these objectives regardless. This is a dangerous juncture that we're at right now. Now, regarding what Iran might do, U.S. policymakers' biggest fear is that even if they can sell an attack on Iran, carry out airstrikes, even weeks and weeks of airstrikes on Iran, 
they're worried that Iran may may do little or nothing back in retaliation. And that is actually addressed in this 2009 policy paper uh, on page 82 under a section titled Facing Iranian Retaliation for U.S. Airstrikes on Iranian Territory. It says, it would not be inevitable that Iran would lash out violently in response to an American air campaign, but no American president should blithely assume that it would not. Iran has not always retaliated for American attacks against it. Initially, after the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103 in December 1988, many believed that this was Iranian retaliation for the shooting down of Iran Air Flight 455 by the American cruiser USS Vincennes in July of that year. However, today, all evidence points to Libya as the culprit for that terrorist attack, which, if true, would suggest that Iran never did retaliate for its loss, nor did Iran retaliate for America's Operation Praying Mantis, which in 1988 resulted in the sinking of most of Iran's major warships. Consequently, it is possible that Iran would simply choose to play the victim if attacked by the United States, assuming, probably correctly, that this would win the clerical regime considerable sympathy, both domestically and internationally. And if you're attacked unilaterally by the United States, having done nothing to provoke the attack, what are you other than a victim? And they never really explain that. However, it is at least equally likely that Iran would shoot back as best it could. As noted above, Iran may attempt to shut down the Strait of Hormuz in response, but this seems unlikely. Doing so would threaten the international oil market and so lose Iran whatever international sympathy it might have gained for being the victim of an American attack. Now, I think what we see in the Red Sea is kind of a preview to what might happen in the Strait of Hormuz. We, we can see the dynamics have changed drastically since 2009 when this paper was written. Of greater importance, American air and naval capabilities are so overwhelming that it would simply be a matter of time before the US military could wipe out its Iranian counterparts and reopen the strait. The result would simply add insult to injury for Tehran, especially given that under these circumstances, American air, uh, naval and air forces available in the Persian Gulf will be vastly more powerful than is normally the case. Such a move by the Iranians would appear to be playing right into Washington's hands, possibly. It seems far more likely that Tehran might choose to respond in kind roughly by lobbing ballistic missiles at U.S. bases, oil facilities, and other high-value targets located in uh, the Gulf states, Israel, and other U.S. ally states. This contingency would merit deploying considerable anti-ballistic missile defense assets in the region and providing as much warning to U.S. allies as possible. Now we can see that the U.S. has already done this. They have already done this anticipating Iran's use of ballistic missiles following an unprovoked U.S. military strike on Iran. They have already done this in the wake of October 7th. Again, the, the premeditated nature of all of this is, is very apparent. If you are aware of these papers and how uh, point by point verbatim they have been implemented since they were written, and, and even before they were written, this was the mindset prevalent in, in Washington, in London, in Brussels. However, because many Iranian leaders would likely be looking to emerge from the fighting in as advantageous a strategic position as possible, and because they would likely calculate that playing the victim would be their best route to that goal, they might well refrain from such retaliatory missile attacks. The most likely method of Iranian retaliation would be some form of terrorist attack. Now, this makes absolutely no sense at all. Elsewhere in the document, it admits that Iran has never carried out any sort of terrorist attack against the United States ever, has never done it. Why would they do so? Especially when they admit that it would not serve their, their strategic interests before or after a, a unilateral unprovoked US attack on Iran. Again, utterly absurd. Uh, if, if Iran would not even respond to U.S. military targets in the region, why would they carry out a, a terrorist attack inside the U.S. they know would just galvanize the American people behind their government? Why would they do that? It makes no sense. They admit how rational and patient the Iranians actually are, and then they throw this in. And I think they throw this in to keep open the possibility of staging some sort of false flag attack that they could use to stir up the American people 
to, again, justify additional unprovoked acts of military aggression against Iran. And the U.S. would need additional acts of military aggression because they admit in the paper that even after weeks of U.S. airstrikes on Iran, Iran could just uh, rebuild everything and carry on. And it actually says, the last piece of this policy option is the question of what follows the airstrikes. It is hard to imagine that even a couple of weeks of American airstrikes encompassing thousands of sorties would simply end the problem of uh, the Iranian nuclear program forever. It is highly likely that at least initially, the Iranian population would rally around the hardest of the hardliners in their government, those people most antagonistic to the United States in response to what Iranians would inevitably see as an unprovoked and unjustified act of aggression, no matter what preceded the American strikes. So what does the Brookings Institution suggest the US should do as a follow-on or a follow-up to these airstrikes? And they admit, even back in 2009, that the best they could do is carry out more airstrikes, but the longer they, they do this, the more ineffective they will become, the, the deeper and more fortified uh, Iran will make potential targets, and, th and then this option will become meaningless. However, back in 2009, they believed that at least at a minimum, these airstrikes would set Iran back long enough for the U.S. to more deeply entrench itself in the region, making it more and more difficult for Iran to influence uh, the region that it's actually located in on the map, but the, the entire world looks completely different today than when this was written. This paper depended heavily on a, a Saudi-Iranian confrontation, tensions between the Saudis and Iran. That no longer exists. Iran and Saudi Arabia are, are repairing their ties. This paper admitted that something would have to be done about Syria before any sort of attack was carried out on Iran. The paper suggested a peace deal between Syria and Israel. Ridiculous was never going to happen. And at that time, they were already planning to overthrow the Syrian government using ex militant extremists armed and backed clandestinely by the US. But that has failed. So, uh, Syria had been isolated from the rest of the Arab world for many years, but now uh, they are repairing their relations. They have been welcomed back into the Arab world. And many of these Arab nations that aided and abetted uh, the U.S. proxy war on Syria are now slowly pivoting away from the U.S. toward multipolarism. They're pivoting away from a, a U.S.-led unipolar world order toward a Chinese, Russian, BRICS-led multipolar world. We are at a very dangerous juncture now in terms of geopolitics. Worldwide, the U.S. continues pursuing uh, the containment, encirclement and containment of Russia, China, also Iran. No matter how unsustainable, unlikely these are to succeed, they are rushing. They see the window of opportunity closing. In many ways, that window has already almost closed or is entirely closed already, but they're going to continue trying anyway. They will continue trying until they no longer possess the means to do so. And it'll be up to the rest of the world, the rational world, to try to de-escalate this as much as possible, to mitigate the loss of life as much as possible in the meantime. Which is why a lot of people say, why, why isn't the Arab world going to war with Israel over Gaza? Because they understand if they do that, they'll be giving the U.S. and Israel exactly what they want. Uh, if they cannot have the region, they want to burn it to the ground. And instead of uh, the Palestinians in Gaza suffering and dying, Everyone in the entire region will suffer and die. And a very similar scenario is unfolding in Ukraine and also in Asia Pacific. Uh, and so this is the reality of where we are. I will continue to keep an eye on this. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to the channel. It's free to do and it helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I particularly suggest you follow me on Telegram. I'm most active there in terms of social media platforms. And the video description below are also all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize YouTube or any of my other social media platforms. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also through Patreon. 
To those who have supported my work, either through one-time donations or donations month to month, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, getting the word out there, helping spread this information around, that is all greatly appreciated. I could not do this work without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.